Well, having taken the nodulus rift apart and made my entire workshop smell of chemical fart, I thought a sensible follow-up video would be an ozone generator. And I got this one a long time ago. In fact, I don't know if this is an actual date. It says 05 stroke 10, so it could be from 2010, which would be about seven years ago from now. Uh, that's that's quite a long time, but this has been sitting around and, and I've never actually got around to taking this to bits. I did do another video, I took a different one apart, and I think the circuitry is probably quite similar. But here's the idea. When you plug this unit into a socket, and here's an oddity, when you plug it into the socket, you can actually hear a slight hissing noise because it is generating ozone already. Let me uh, bring this up to the microphone and see if you can actually hear that. You might not hear it. A very slight high frequency hissing noise. But when you uh, turn the knob from off position, a fan comes on at low level. And as you then turn the knob further up, it generates more and more ozone according to the requirements. So um, I'll show you the principle of generating ozone with corona discharge, which is what this one does. Uh, and then we can take it to bits. So let's uh, bring in the notepad, focus down onto the notepad, and this is the principle. So if you get a couple of electrodes in the close vicinity of each other and put a high voltage AC current across them, AC voltage across them, current will flow, but it will usually be in the form of quite a vivid spark just jumping straight across and uh, it would get hot, it would burn, it would, it would be really inefficient. These electrodes would get very hot. It would kind of work, but it wouldn't actually get much exposure to the air which is kind of important. So what they do is they get uh, two electrodes, typically, and they put an insulator between them. And the insulator is normally ceramic. You get glass, you get mica, but the ceramic has one of the highest dielectric strengths. It's the less likely to break down with the high voltage. And because the, the spark can't jump right across now, and because the current's flowing backwards and forwards, you end up with lots of tiny little sparks just streaming out and that manifests itself as a purple glow, and that's the corona discharge. And if you then pass air through that, then when a molecule of oxygen goes through, and oxygen is called O2 because it's got two atoms of oxygen, so they're the two atoms of oxygen, when they pass through, and you've got multiple clusters of them, then they actually get split apart into individual atoms of oxygen. And one of the ways they can recombine is an unstable way. Well, there's many ways they can recombine, but the stable way would be just to go back into the two molecule, uh, two atom oxygen molecule. But many of them will rejoin as an unstable cluster of uh, three atoms of oxygen. That's ozone. That's O3. You'll also get uh, multiples like four uh, joining together, and that's also unstable. But the main thing is that when these unstable uh, molecules called ozone make contact with, say, an airborne contaminant, one of the oxygen molecules will be left on it and the other two will break away and uh, they will be the stable bond of two oxygens again. And in doing so, they oxidise that, that, sort of, that chemical pollutant in the air. It could be bacteria, it could be anything really. Um, so what these units do, uh, if it's anything like the one I took in the past, apart in the past, it's got a ceramic tube with a conductive coating the outside, and then it has some sort of arrangement for an electrode to go round the inside, so you get at the point, and uh, what can I see in this one? Uh, yes, it's using the same system. So it's actually got a couple of needles that just make contact, and it means that where it makes contact, you get a tiny trace quantity of that corona discharge. And because the air is blowing through it, then you get a trace quantity of ozone. Some of that air gets converted into ozone. And as I say, this this is a one of these things that, you know, some people say it's really hazardous. You should not breathe ozone at all because it is so dangerous. And in high concentrations, it's dangerous. Uh, it will cause irritation. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, 100 parts per billion, you can smell ozone as a sort of bleachy smell in the air. It's quite nice at low levels. It's really horrible and nauseating at higher levels. And at higher levels, again, it causes that. It makes your eyes sting. It makes your nose run. It, it just makes the sort of what they call the mucal membranes, the sort of your nasal passages, anything wet that is the most receptive to it. And it makes it uncomfortable because it's basically oxidizing it. 
And some materials are also prone to oxidization, like uh, rubber is very prone to ozone damage. It causes it to sort of um, embrittle and crack. It causes a crazing across it. So often to protect rubbers, they'll, they'll put a sort of wax sealant on them or an oil to cover the surface, some sort of protective glazing agent. However, let's open this up and take a look inside because that's uh, what we do. So this appears to have four screws holding it apart together. And you can see the air, the air inlet port here, and it looks like a standard sort of computer fan. So this at initial glance, uh, here's the computer fan. It is 12 volt, uh, 100 milliamp, and it's got it's been staked on. It's got the plastic pins holding it, and they've just melted a couple of them di at diagonal opposing corners to stake that in. There's the um, Corona discharge tube. I should actually focus more up onto this, shouldn't I? The Corona discharge tube with the two needles. It's the same arrangement as before. It's got the circuit board has some holes around the outside so the air can flow past the outside, and some air will flow through the middle. And it's got the conductive coating there, and then these two needles that appear to be just pressed into sockets and shaped so they just touch the inside of that tube. I can actually see a slight discoloration where they've touched inside the tube. I wonder if that's uh, probably oxidation of the uh, metal of the pins themselves. There's the high voltage transformer that's used to step the voltage up to the point the corona can be formed. There's the power supply. You know what? I'm going to take some pictures of this and then we can explore it in greater detail. So I'll be back in a moment. Right, I'm back. So I'll just focus down onto this just so it's nice and sharp. So let's uh, follow this through. We start off at the very bottom here with uh, a fuse. This fuse is a fairly standard, I think they used to call it a Euro fuse. It's a little round package, looks like a rectifier, but it's just got two pins. Uh, incidentally, I've flipped this, I flipped this image here so that uh, it matches side for side, but this time it's less confusing because it's the, there's no uh, text or components, surface mount components to back with all the markings back to front so it doesn't look as bad as it did last time. So uh, we've got the two pin fuse down here and then we've got the uh, a suppression capacitor, a little X2 suppression capacitor, a com mode suppression choke designed to, it basically um, has this effect that uh, if the, the low frequency coming in, of the mains coming in, can easily get through that transformer, but any noise trying to get back out at high frequency counteracts itself. It basically creates a, a magnetic field in one direction that is counteracted by the magnetic field in the other, and it, has a, it means they can fit a lot of suppression in a very small area. Then we've got a bridge rectifier, and we've got a big smoothing capacitor, uh, and this chip, now the chip appears to be a TNY255PN, which is a, a tiny, a tiny, what do they call it? Tiny switcher? Tiny switch? I think it's tiny switch they call it. Uh, but it's the basis of a super ultra simple switch mode power supply. And it requires very few extra components. In this case, there's an oddity. There's the transformer it's using to actually convert the mains down to the lower voltage. Here's the reservoir capacitor. There, there is an oddity. There's a few strange things about this that don't actually tally up with the sort of manufacturer's guideline. And one of them is uh, this arrangement of two diodes across the coil. So basically speaking across the coil, they give various options for uh, creating uh, a suppressor. One of the most common that you find in, say, electronic lamp drivers is this diode and then a basically a small suppression network too. And the point of that is that when the uh, tiny switch, that's what it's called, it's the tiny switch, when it, it turns off, you get a spike from the primary of the uh, transformer. And if that was unsuppressed, it would put the little uh, chip, the transistor inside that chip under stress. So what they have, a couple of options here. One is the capacitor with, that's going to suppress that spike, but only in one direction because uh, it's, it's not needed in another direction. It's just being switched from positive to the negative rail. Another one that's one of the easiest I've seen is a, virtually a snubber network across the transistor inside there. Uh, and it's really, it's the classic snubber network with extremely low values designed for that short spike. 
But what they've done is they've used what appears to be a transient diode. I'm not even sure the symbol for that. I'll just randomly draw a Zenery type thing, but in series with another ordinary diode. So uh, in that case, I'm guessing it's a high frequency one. Uh, but in this case, what actually happens there is as soon as the voltage in that, uh, on this positive with respect to the positive rail, exceeds a certain level, it shunts it out. So that's why they've done that. One of the other oddities here, the feedback is super simple. The, the chip has everything. It, it, the chip really just needs that suppression network. It needs this little uh, decoupling capacitor, which they call a bypass capacitor, which is kind of like a power supply capacitor. It's this one here. And uh, the, all it needs after that is an opto-isolator input, and everything else is built in. There's no external resistors or anything. It's just that opto-isolator connected, that capacitor, and then some filtering. And the way these uh, little chips operate is that when they turn on, the transistor turns on, it's got a timer inside it that turns on after a certain, uh, on a certain frequency uh, rate. But it's purely current operated. As soon as the current through the coil exceeds a certain level, uh, then that uh, MOSFET turns off. So it kind of self-adjusts to different transformers. It's a very clever design. Uh, the feedback is through that opto-isolator, and normally in the drawings it's shown as a 1K resistor, but they've sh used a 47-ohm resistor here, which is quite a low value. Uh, and then there's a Zener diode, and the idea is that as soon as the voltage across this output capacitor starts uh, exceeding the desired voltage uh, then the Zener starts to conduct and current flows through the opto isolator, and uh, that then uh, turns it on and that stops this sort of chip generating uh, more output. It stops it running until the voltage is dropped again. That opto isolator feedback goes back off. So there's a really massive, a generous uh, diode here on the output. That's this diode here and the output here, and then the uh, smoothing capacitor here, which is this capacitor here. And that, this is generated, because I've measured it, this is, it's generating a 13.5 volt supply. <clears throat> that then is used to power a 555. This is just an ordinary 555 timer, and it's driving this MOSFET. And it's basically switching the MOSFET on and off. And I think the potentiometer uh, input, the variable power control from the side of the unit, all it's doing is varying a resistor value over there to presumably vary this a mark space ratio. It could be the frequency, but it's most likely a sort of mark space ratio in that. So the main transformer here gets a sort of fixed size of pulse. Then there's an oddity. There's an inductor in series of the transformer, which is odd, because I would have thought the inductance of the primary in this would have been enough. I'm not sure why they've done that. Uh, the MOSFET here is um, IRF530, and it's got a resistor across it here to keep it off. It's the, between the gate and the negative rail. So the output of the 555, pin 3 here, actually connects right across to that. Let's see if I can trace that here. There it is. There's pin 3 connecting right across to the gate of that MOSFET. There's a bit of an oddity here. There's a component here shown as a link, but they've actually soldered a wire link across the back, which is kind of messy, but that's uh, it does the job. Now, here's something very odd. There were a couple of hot components in this board. One was this Zener diode, which is quite odd. They've put a Zener diode, a 4-volt Zener diode, in series with the fan, so that that nudges the voltage down. But it means the Zener diode is dissipating, well, if the fan is rated around about 100 milliamps, it's dropping 4 volts, so it's dissipated about 400 milliwatts, and it reached about 82 degrees Celsius. It's a fairly messy way of doing that, but ultimately I suppose it works. But the hottest component with a temperature between 75 to 90 degrees Celsius was this capacitor, which is across the MOSFET. And that is, when the MOSFET turns off, it's kind of, I guess it's basically absorbing the transient. It's being used as suppression. Um, but that, that means that it's being charged and discharged at very high speed. And that, that was getting to a really high temperature. It's odd. Quite strange, that. Uh, this blue capacitor here is a class Y capacitor. It's designed to provide... It's connected between the main side to the low-voltage side in this. But, again, it's kind of designed to provide an alternative path back for an, uh, elect current coupled from the main side through transformer capacitively. And it, it just provides a, a reduction of RF interference. But 
I'd normally associate the use of this capacitor with where you've got leads going out or something that could radiate that interference like an antenna. Very odd. The high voltage section then is being cycled on and off um, at that varying ratio depending on the power required. And that then, the output of that, if we look at the transformer here, it's let's just draw a box around it. It's a very nice transformer. It's fully potted. It's been boxed and then potted in resin. And it's got multi-segmented uh, secondaries here. And that means that the voltage across each secondary is going to be much lower than just having one continuously wound secondary. And that means that it's much, le much less likely to break down. It's a common technique. It's used in like small neon transformers and things like that, or igniter transformers. It means that using standard windings, they can get up to a much higher voltage by having this uh, split bob in the multiple sections. Uh, it's also got a fairly modest primary winding, which uh, kind of fits in with the sort of the way it's being driven at probably modestly low frequency by the 555. Um, yeah, interesting circuitry. There is an LED tacked on the opposite side for illumination, um, and it's just fed from a resistor, this resistor here. And that's fundamentally it. So it's divides into three sections. It's got the, the power supply here, the oscillator section driving this transformer, I suppose four sections really, the uh, fan circuit, which is just the 13.5 the volts drop to 9.5 by this scener, and then the corona section, which is the super high voltage winding here, then feeding across to the ceramic core that's got this metal coating on it, and it's that metal coating is not only one of the electrodes, but it's been used to solder on here as well. And uh, then it's got those little needles, presumably stainless steel needles, which also makes sense for plugging it into sockets, because otherwise you can't really solder stainless steel too easily. Uh, and that uh, then they just touch the inside and create little points of corona discharge. So it's a very, uh, it's a logical design. It's got a few odd quirks, most notably that suppression circuit, which works. Uh, this capacitor getting very hot, which I suppose that's, they're really just trying to protect the MOSFET there. And the use of just an ordinary sensible 555 to drive the uh, out the uh, transformer. So this thing does just generate tiny quantities of ozone. It's not trying to, it's not trying to do what some of these plates you get on eBay do that just blitz ozone out and they're they're designed to deodorize entire rooms uh, preferably while you're, they're not occupied hotels use that <clears throat> hotels have timer units with big uh, ozone plates and big fans that you basically wheel it into a room that someone's been smoking in or something's something terrible's happened and it's created an aroma perhaps the perhaps the nodulous rift demonstration team have been using that room but they wheel the unit in plug it in at the wall and they set a timer and then they leave the room and close the door and the unit just pumps out a large quantity of ozone to sterilise the room and get rid of all those uh, chemical smells and sort of organic smells. And then after a certain time delay, the cleaning staff go back in and the room, the ozone has what they call a decay time. It's almost like a radioactive material has a decay time. But ozone has a certain time it will take to revert back to oxygen uh, with all the sort of... the, the Ozone molecules floating about bonding onto stuff, and it's, I think it's a half life of about 20 minutes that it has that oxidizing effect. But when you've ozonated a room, it's just, you know, at first you think that's quite a novel smell, and then it just gets really annoying after a while. The smell just gets really disgusting, and you get sick of the smell very quickly. I did a lot of experiments with ozone, I got sick of it very quickly indeed. But, um, yeah, interesting, nice implementation. And it is just really, it is super low output. It's not really something you can even smell when you walk into the room, but it doesn't need to make a smell of the ozone. It just needs to create that trace quantity that will just erase certain lingering aromas. So it's quite a nicely implemented little unit.